So our uh, final speaker um, topic is deep learning for science uh, from Stephen Farrell. Uh, Stephen Farrell is a machine learning engineer at NERSC. He supports scientific deep learning workflows on HPC systems through software development, benchmarking, user support, and training. His research interests include applications of deep learning to high energy physics and proteins, as well as deep learning methods for structured data such as graphs. Steve is co-chair co of the MLPerf HPC working group and was previously a member of the ATLAS experiment at CERN. So welcome, Steve. Uh, thank you, Yan. Thanks for the nice introduction. Thanks for folks who are still here, despite it being time for lunch, at least for those of you in my time zone. Uh, I think my talk is a little bit different than others because it's going to be less about how to use GPUs, how to do things on GPUs, and a little more high level about deep learning for science with GPU stuff in there and demonstrations of on, on GPUs and a little bit about our Cori GPU system. So um, let's just get into it. Uh, so the three main ideas here that I'm going to try to get across is that, um, well, science is, is getting bigger, um, solving bigger, harder problems with bigger data sets. And uh, meanwhile, there's this new tool set called Deep Learning, which provides powerful new tools that, that can work pretty well for these big science problems. And then third, these new emerging Deep Learning for Science workloads need large compute resources. And we can um, address that at least partially with GPUs, increasingly with HPC systems, and with NERSC. So first, some of the relevant uh, brief stuff about deep learning. I, I mean, I, I assume we've all got some familiarity with deep learning. Uh, we probably know deep learning is powering many recent technologies. It's transforming a lot of companies from the ground up. It, it's appearing in things like um, language translation, uh, speech recognition, it's powering the captions that you see on the bottom of the screen, for example. Um, people are getting excited about applications in healthcare and autonomous driving, and then there's cool stuff too, like applications to arts and games, and many more, of course. Uh, so deep learning, of course, is this subset of machine learning and AI, which is uh, basically powered by deep neural networks. Um, so um, that's you know neural networks that have several layers of computation, usually lots of parameters, and a lot of uh, capacity for for map for learning mappings of functions from inputs to outputs. So the idea of neural networks is not at all new. Of course, uh, the perceptron was proposed back in the 50s, and then things were popularized in the 80s. But um, clearly, we're in this deep learning revolution. Nowadays, since around 2012, 2013, so um, the reason for that is kind of fewfold. The first one, of course, is the availability of data. So we have a lot more large curated data sets available and deep learning methods, you've probably heard, um, can do better than traditional uh, machine learning methods or other types of methods uh, if you have enough data. And then the second one, which is um, particularly relevant for us today, is the availability and usage of GPUs for these applications. Uh, the plot here is this um, fairly famous ImageNet competition, and the error rate is in the red, and the blue is the usage of GPUs over time. Around 2012 and 2013, I think it was 2012 when Deep Learning uh, first won, and from then on, it was just always winning. And that's uh, at the same time that GPUs were taking off. So um, things like this one's deep learning method started using GPUs and started winning competitions like this one in particular. Um, it really sort of built the hype around deep learning and then a lot of people started getting into it and trying out ideas and, and pushing on this in particular on this third area here which is the algorithmic advances. Uh, I'm not going to go into any of that stuff but just to call out that you know there's a lot more going on than just the first two here. <clears throat> So to expand a little bit on that GPU thing, so why GPUs, why are they chosen for deep learning? They're definitely, at least as of today, um, the accelerator of choice for implementing deep learning workloads. And uh, why is that? Um, this may have been mentioned yesterday or today, I'm not sure, so apologies, but um, well, neural networks, they have a lot of potential parallelism in them um, at various levels. So usually you're, you know, sampling from a data set and different samples of the data set can be processed mostly in parallel. 
but even just for the processing of one sample in a neural network, there's um, uh, a lot of parallelism there in the computation itself. And that computation is fairly regular in some sense. So it's mainly just linear transformations like big matrix multiplications and pointwise functions like these nonlinearities like the rectified linear unit. <clears throat> So much like how GPUs are great for graphics processing, GPUs are great for this, for deep neural networks. Um, the computation patterns, these motifs are uh, fairly simple. They're, sim they're sorry, similar enough. <clears throat> um, and that's, yeah, so GPUs have many simple cores compared to CPU, and then they have a higher memory bandwidth to feed those cores and keep them churning. Uh, these plots I took from a blog here that just show them the top, the, the uh, peak per um, plot performance, uh, the blue is the CPUs, and then the, uh, the memory bandwidth on the bottom. <clears throat> but um, GPUs, single, so <laughs> getting deep learning to run on GPUs is not at all the end of the story. Uh, it's not like deep learning, machine learning pr practitioners were suddenly able to run on GPUs and then never needed anything else, right? That, that's never the way uh, anything works when it comes to computing. Um, obviously, folks started applying deep learning to more and more complex tasks. Uh, and to do that, they're using larger and larger models. And this translates into um, requiring more and more compute. So this plot on the right is from a blog post um, from OpenAI, which shows here on the axis the, basically the amount of compute needed to train various um, well-publicized deep learning results. Um, notice how this is a uh, log scale. So this is really like exponential explosion over time in terms of the amount of compute needed to, uh, to train these models. And this doesn't even include the biggest stuff from the last year. In particular, OpenAI recently put out a humongous language model with over 100 billion parameters, which is just insane. So for many of these deep learning problems here, a single GPU actually just doesn't cut it. Uh, you may be able to train on a single GPU, but you'd have to wait you know, several months or even worse to actually train a model to convergence. So the usual way we tackle things like this is to throw more hardware at the problem, right? So um, we want to throw more GPUs to, to train these models and do some parallelization of the training. So uh, there are different ways to do parallelization of training of deep neural networks. The common approaches fall into these two categories, so data parallelism and model parallelism. In data parallelism, basically what you're doing is you're partitioning your data across the devices and you're replicating the model across the devices. So um, if you're doing stochastic gradient descent and you're sampling mini batches of data from your training set, you take that mini batch and you split it up across your GPUs and each GPU will have essentially the same model and, and, um, and process its local subset. In contrast with model parallelism, what you're doing is actually partitioning the model instead across your devices. And even that can be done in a few different ways. So you could do it layer by layer, you could have different layers of a neural network on different devices, or as this little illustration down here shows, uh, you can actually split up the linear algebra operations within a layer and have them be distributed across devices. Um, generally it's called model parallelism though, if, if the weights of the model are somehow distributed or partitioned across devices. Um, so yeah, there are various subcategories of these two and there are ways to combine them. In practice, the most widely used technique is what's called synchronous data parallel training. And so that's basically data parallelism, um, but everything's happening in, in sync. So um, all the workers are processing their local chunk of the mini batch. And then at the end of that training step, they do, um, they, uh, they do a synchronization of the results. So they, they do an all reduce of the gradients and then do their own updates. And then all processors have the same um, set of model weights throughout the rest of training. So uh, to apply this to big problems, to really scale this up, uh, what folks are doing in practice to try and make training as fast as possible is they're trying to train with um, the largest possible batch sizes and the largest possible learning rates. And, and these are kind of related, but um, with large batches, you can parallelize better. You can spread it across uh, GPUs. And with large learning rates, then you can try to converge the answer in the fewest possible steps because you're taking larger steps. And basically, large batches let you use larger learning rates. 
uh, but only to a certain extent. This is not at all a free lunch, and in particular, um, numerous algorithmic challenges arise when you're doing this at really large scale, basically instability and overfitting. So I won't go into any more details of how this works in practice, but we do have a tutorial. There's some resources at the end here. So now I'll start to tie this back into deep learning for science. Uh, deep learning can certainly transform science, and I think we're seeing that happen now because of the powerful capabilities of deep neural networks. Uh, they can automatically learn patterns from your high dimensional data. They can encode inductive biases and symmetries, which can be really important for science problems. For example, conv convolutional operations, um, they're uh, translationally equivariant. So if you have that kind of symmetry in your data, or, or um, if they, they use uh, localized kernel patches. So if your data has localized features and can build like hierarchical representations of these features, then, uh, then it's, a good, um, you know, it's a good type of model. And there are lots of things like that in deep learning. Um, so there are many possible application areas, but some of the ones that I think have been emerging as particularly promising lately in these still early days are things like analysis of large scientific data sets. For example, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is producing lots of data, and you can use deep learning to find new physics signals in this data and potentially get more out of the, um, the raw data features than you can with handcrafted um, traditional physics-based criteria. The next one is to accelerate expensive simulations. So a lot of science domains have this problem of very computationally expensive simulations. And so various fields are looking at generative models and things like that to supplement or replace those simulations with something faster. And then the third is real-time control and design of uh, experiments. <clears throat> So adoption is on the rise uh, in terms of using deep learning for science. Uh, the science communities are definitely drinking the Kool-Aid. There's a growing number of uh, papers, both investigating and proposing methods, but also we're starting to see papers that are real applications and peer reviewed journals that are using deep learning, which is great, um, but it's still got a long way to go. Um, in terms of uh, conferences, you see a really growing presence in machine learning and deep learning applications, both in the pure machine learning conference space, things like NeurIPS, um, which is um, an immensely popular conference now, uh, but also in the science domain, the domain science conferences, you see various tracks and um, more and more uh, machine learning based contributions every year. <clears throat> and um, there's also been recognition of achievements in, in AI with awards like the Turing Award and the Gordon Bell Prize in 2018. Uh, additionally, the DOE is drinking the Kool-Aid in terms of uh, these new methods. So there's been several funding calls in AI for science over the last year. I see we had this big town hall series across four national labs that produced this 300 page report. So a lot of work went into that. And there's this anticipated uh, ECP-like program on AI for science. Um, so now I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but just show that there are a lot of interesting science applications, different ways to apply deep learning to different domains. Uh, this is kind of cherry picked examples from things that folks at NERSC have been working on, uh, showing that you could use deep learning for, you know, generative models in, um, in cosmology and things like uh, super resolution problems, high energy physics applications down here, both for reconstruction and for in, uh, inference with simulations. This one on the left, the climate analytics one. So this is particularly interesting to note because this is a it's a climate segmentation case run on climate simulation data, uh, large data, and it was scaled up on Summit to around 27,000 GPUs. It broke this exaflop barrier in um, FP16, and for that it won the or it shared the Gordon Bell Prize uh, in 2018. So it really shows what you can do with GPUs for deep learning and HPC. Um, some extra additional examples coming out of our NESAP for Learning program at NERSC. Uh, this is where we are partnering NERSC resources with the science teams to help enable and enhance their machine learning for science workloads. Uh, so things like catalysis deep learning for thermal chemistry, more generative networks for energy physics to replace expensive simulations, um, generative models for turbulent flow, uh, reinforcement learning for controlling light sources and um, spatial temporal modeling on really large data sets like um, brain imaging and, and climate. So a lot of interesting stuff there. And then that segues nicely into me saying a little bit more about how we support deep learning for science at NERSC. So we provide our deep learning software stack 
Uh, we have prioritized uh, prioritized support for the most popular frameworks, for example, TensorFlow, Keras, and PyTorch, and distributed training libraries that we've investigated and, and know map well onto our systems and have good performance, like Uber's Horvod, uh, native PyTorch distributed, and the, um, the Cray plugin from Cray. <coughs> um, oops, we um, we support at least in a prioritized sense uh, a couple of parameter tuning libraries. So this is that's something that all folks need to do, and HPC is good for because you have large compute resources. Uh, Cray has an HBO tool, and Raytune came out of uh, Rise Lab. Um, and we also support or enable workflow solutions through things like Jupyter and Shifter, et cetera. So, for example, we have NVIDIA containers that folks can use uh, via Shifter on our, on our GPU systems. Um, so this is the stuff that we prioritize support for, but also we, we really try to make sure to enable that users can uh, deploy their own, um, their own frameworks, their own tools, whatever. <clears throat> uh, so after the software is the hardware, of course, and I, I think Cori GPU and Perlmutter were already described uh, yesterday or today, um, but um, these are the kind of systems that we're looking at, and Perlmutter, of course, is coming a little bit later, but for now we have the Cori GPU system, which is very nice for us. We're using it to prepare our machine learning workloads for Perlmutter. So that means we're developing and tuning the software stack. We're using it to understand performance and do benchmarking. And we're also doing some cool research projects as well. Uh, if you look at how the system is being used now, actually machine learning is the dominant workload, which is interesting. So in terms of system hours, it's something like greater than 75%. Uh, this is a plot on the right showing some cumulative usage over time. Um, but also uh, jobs are running on many GPUs. So we see some jobs that are even requesting it about like full system scale, which is around, um, you know, 16 nodes times eight or 17-ish kind of nodes. Um, so this is nice. And I think it's a promising indicator of the enthusiasm for machine learning and deep learning on Perlmutter. And obviously we're excited about that. <clears throat> so to assess the performance on Cori GPU, we use a variety of benchmarks. So we're testing different frameworks, uh, different kinds of models. We're looking at, well, we're comparing hardware, our CPU systems and the GPU systems, which you see down here in the lower left for, for PyTorch. Uh, we compare different communication uh, libraries and we look at scaling. So um, it's kind of not very surprising, but of course we see very good acceleration um, running things on our GPUs compared to the CPU systems. So this table here is the training throughput, so higher is, is better. Um, on the right, we have scaling plots of um, just a few examples of PyTorch up here and TensorFlow down here. And the TensorFlow one shows comparisons of the using the optimized nickel libraries from NVIDIA compared to the yellow is just a very unoptimized uh, MPI library. So in summary, I think the system is performing well um, and we're gonna kind of keep working on it. Um, then just really quickly to wrap up, we also do a bit of outreach and training events, kind of like this, but specifically for Deep Learning for Science. So the first one I'll mention is we have this Deep Learning for Science School. Last year we did a week long event with a very comprehensive program. It was hands on, there was posters. Um, you can check out all the material online here. There are videos and um, the, the code examples are there. Uh, we had folks running on our Cori GPU system, actually, and that worked out really well. Uh, this year, because of COVID-19, we're not doing an in-person thing. Instead, we're doing a more spread out weekly webinar series. Um, but um, uh, it's going to be a really great program. There's already a lot of stuff being put together on the agenda, which you can see here. And I encourage you to register at this link to get the connection details. Um, additionally, we have a Deep Learning at Scale tutorial that we've done at a bunch of conferences, jointly organized with Cray and NVIDIA. Um, there's again material you can find here. It's accepted again at, at SC this year. So um, check it out. I don't know, maybe it'll be virtual, but uh, check it out anyway. And we also have the data seminar series, uh, which sometimes has more educational stuff. So um, I think I'll just let you read the conclusion. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Steve. Um, any questions from the audience? Raise your hands or post. And also from the panelists. I have a I have a, one question for the users. Like if uh, saying I'm a, I'm a new user, I'm not a DL expert or a machine learning expert. I just want to try some model on my data sets. Um, uh, does NERSC provide a list of uh, 
simple, non-sophisticated deep learning mo models for plug and play? Uh, um, well, well, we do have we do have some examples. We do have some examples in our tutorial programs. For example, at the, the Deep Learning for Science School, and there's code there that folks can try out and use. Um, we don't have like um, a library of simple examples that folks can just plug into their problem at the moment, but it's it's stuff that we've talked about doing and tried to potentially provide. And and we have you know consulting services that can help folks with getting things started. I see. I see. Uh, there's another question. Um, what sort of scaling difference have uh, seen between different distributed backends, uh, Horrible and PyTorch distributed? Um, right. So I don't think we explore everything on Cori GPU. Um, for example, I don't. For example, for, with TensorFlow, we're mainly looking at Horvod, and I don't know that we've done um, like real performance comparisons to. Um, like built-in TensorFlow distribution strategies here. Um, I think we might need to look into that. And for PyTorch also, we're mainly just looking at the native um, distributed library, but looking at the different communication backends. So I don't have it here, but I have compared like nickel to glue to um, things like MPI. And so we at least have those numbers and we know, you know, um, you know, nickel is the best and Horvod performs well. Horvod performs especially well with nickel rather than MPI. Um, but there are other things that we could probably look at more closely. I see. Another question from the audience. How is the work on ML Perf giving you insight um, uh, for your, your work at NERSC? Yeah, so, uh, well, one thing is that we're actually using our MLPerf HPC benchmarks to assess the performance of our systems here. So both our CPU and our GPU. Um, in fact, I'm one of the top users on Cori GPU, or these staff users, because I'm always running the MLPerf HPC benchmarks there. Um, so it, it, it's part of our benchmarking strategy and helps us, helps inform us on, on how well things are, um, how well things are doing. Um, I think that's mainly it. There may be other more subtle things that uh, I'm not sure on. I see. So another one is what's the recommended distributed learning framework on ERSC? Uh, Horovod, will it be the same in the near future? Um, yeah, so I, I think, I don't know that we're going to specifically say you should absolutely use just this one solution. Um, but we at least have a um, you know sets of recommendations that are kind of reflected on what you see here on this plot. So um, for for PyTorch, you know we'd recommend using either PyTorch Distributed or PyTorch Plus Horvod with Nickel definitely as the communication backend. Um, and then with TensorFlow, um, well we, we we mostly look at Horvod, but um, I think the Cray plugin also performs well. And um, if you're using Horvod, you should use Nickel. So there there are sets of recommendations uh, that we have. I see. So uh, two questions are very similar. So um, how do you measure the DL, the deep learning workload on core GPU? And uh, what is the major performance bottleneck, uh, like memory, load balance, insufficient parallelism? Right. Um, yeah, so I, I think these are kind of asking different things. But I think like, how do you measure the DL workload is more about like, how do we know? How are we like inferring what the jobs are and who the users are. And we do have um, ways to collect that data. So some of it is um, the way we instrument our module loads. So if folks load our software, then we kind of, we, we log a message and we know um, sort of who they are and what the job is. And we can do that to, to figure things out. Um, we also kind of have been tracking as we add users to Cori GPU and have a sense for who is actually doing machine learning, what kinds of workloads are running. This is possible now because the system is not, you know, there's not like thousands of people on it. I, I don't know the number, but it's, it's manageable at this point. We can actually go through the spreadsheet and say, there's machine learning, there's machine learning, there's machine learning. And uh, with these things, we're able to kind of understand how much machine learning is, is actually running. Um, for the bottle, performance bottlenecks kinds of things, um, it, it actually just depends a lot, I think, on exactly what you're running. So deep learning can often be bottlenecked by data, particularly at very large scale. Um, I.O. can be an issue. Um, if you're running certain models that don't have very favorable, you know, if you're running distributed with models that don't have very favorable computation to communication ratios, sort of like, uh, like a small LSTM you're scaling up, uh, you're going to be communication bound basically but for th things like uh, resnet 50 like you see here 
I think it's really more just computation bound and the communication is, is not a huge noticeable effect and communication is, is pretty good. So it, it depends a bit on what you're running. I see, cool, thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. I think right now as uh, Steve learning getting really, really popular uh, and with a lot of application here at HPC. So yeah, we hope uh, we can uh, continue to providing better services for the users. Thank you, Steve.